Hi, um, so this is Environmental Practices for the Web. This is a talk I gave at uh, Bath Digital Festival this year um, in, in October. Um, I didn't have a recording of that session, so I thought it'd be nice to um, make a recording and put it up on the, the web on YouTube uh, so you can check it out. And let's get going. So I'm Ben Byford. I run Technology and Creativity Limited. Uh, we make games and interactive things on the web. Um, I also am heavily involved in AI stuff and AI ethics, and I have a consultancy called Tech uh, Ethical by Design. So check that out, ethicalby.design, and also check out the Machine Ethics podcast where we talk about everything kind of tech ethics with a strong focus on AI technologies, their history, how they impact uh, their use cases, all that sort of great things. Um, so what are we talking about today? We're really talking about, um, you know, the web and the web's effects on climate change and, and the climate emergency that we find ourselves in. Um, so here's a quote. Uh, essentially, the estimates suggest that if the internet were a country, it would be the world's seventh biggest polluter. And, you know, I don't think it's a stretch to imagine how that works out, right? We have the internet, which is kind of sort of pervasive now across most countries. And you have electricity powering that situation and different sources of that electricity, which we'll probably come across, uh, come to in the talk. But there's just so much power going into communication technologies. So some caveats, right? So these are educated assumptions and they are predicated on these things. Um, I did some, um, you know, reading of books and research and all those links are at the end. But the idea here is that the web infrastructure is inherently dirty. That is the premise here that we are stipulating that the, it, uh, the actual infrastructure of how the web works is dirty. Um, that people, um, that websites that are not built um, are eco websites. So basically, you know, if you create something, if you have a great idea, if you don't create it, is that good or bad for uh, ecology? It's, it's an interesting kind of thought uh, problem. Um, that's a caveat that there, which, you know, I'm really interested in talking to people about on Twitter and, and things like that afterwards. Um, and there's Another caveat that people are rational agents. So the idea here is that people will actually be able to do these things, want to do it. Um, and we, we're deciding that they are rational and not, not going to do crazy stuff. Um, and I don't have all the answers. This is just kind of an ongoing conversation that we're all having. Um, this is just some thoughts that I've had. Um, I've been working on the web, um, web design, web dev for over 12 years now professionally and uh, so some things that I've uh, come across I've seen I've read articles I've seen etc so here's kind of like a breakdown of some of that stuff um, so we're going to look at to start with kind of the web design and performance so we're going to take you from things which are close at hand things that you might do daily and consider and things that you already might know about and, um, you know, having a discussion around those things, taking you further away into kind of this broader view into kind of what, you know, your day to day existence and life, your business, how you run your business, contracts you make with other people and how those actually impact the environmental aspects of what we do as well. So let's start with the easiest, probably the web design performance. So. The good thing about this is environmental web practices lead to faster user-focused experiences. So things that we can do, um, and we're talking about this in this presentation, they can often lead to a better user experience anyway. Um, maybe better, you know, longer battery lives. Um, maybe you're using less user bandwidth um, and you're certainly using less resources and hopefully getting charged less. So. This comes into like, you know, use less, 
and also pay less sorts of situation. So it's a win-win and it's also a win for the user. Things are snappier, faster, that sort of thing as well. Um, so hopefully you'll be familiar with some of these titles that I'm going to be going through. I'm just going to kind of briefly kind of give them an overview and it's sort of up to you to really dig deep and, and get to know these sort of topics a bit better. Um, so the first one, compression, minification, gzipping, and the way that your information is getting passed between the server, wherever it's being held, and to the client, the user. Um, you know, the technology is being used on those sides. And this, again, comes back to the, the predication of smaller is better. Um, if we are deciding that the the infrastructure of the internet is inherently dirty, you maybe have most of the world's internet is run on coal or a mixture of nuclear coal renewables and there's certain percentages there and we can work that out. You know, we still have a lot of that, it's dirty. And we also have embedded uh, carbon in the hardware production cycle. So we have all these things introducing kind of environmental factors. So we're saying that um, putting things over the wire is going to cost us in carbon because we're sending, we're using electricity to do that. We're using the infrastructure that has embedded carbon in it. Um, so what we can do to reduce that in a really a kind of obvious way is minification, g-zipping, making everything smaller, right? So make sure you're making the smallest things, sending the least amount of info, information over the wire. You should be minifica minificating. You should be g-zipping. These are technologies which are like kind of no-brainers and just work uh, and not very hard to set up. Um, HTTP2 and three strategies. There might be a little bit more reading there, um, but the idea here is that if you have in the past maybe done, done sharding or large files which have uh, libraries bundled up into them, for example, there is strategies that you might want to take in, into account. For example, HTTP2 um, and 3, you can stream files from the same domain. So if you are hosting and have HTTP2 or 3 enabled on a server and it's coming from the same place, um, you might be able to stream those files um, over to you instead of having these handshakes, uh, the traditional twos and fro's to get each file, you are getting one handshake and then you are streaming lots of different files. So it means that the reliance on kind of bundling things up is lessened in that case. And it might be that if you have things which are uh, used a lot, say back in the day, it would be uh, jQuery would be a good example of this. Um, so the jQuery library, you might want to go and get that from a CDN, maybe a Google CDN, and maybe you don't want to bundle that into your app because that URL can actually be cached by the browser. So if the browser already has that uh, file and it's the latest version, it actually doesn't need to go and get it at that point. So there's all these kind of conf conflicting kind of ideas that are trying to compete for how you structure the HTML and downloading files. And it just take into account that you want to try and use their strategies well. You want to use the new stuff coming through HTTP 2 and 3, like streaming, um, you know, concatenate your files together, going and, and there's a less of a need to bundle all your files into one and more of a need to just make sure things are compressed, make sure you have good caching and that sort of thing. Again, to, to reduce the amount of uh, requests and the amount of data coming over. Um, the biggest thing that you can do in any website um, um, due to the numbers is to reduce that content, reduce the images, the fonts, the, the bigger files, the videos and things like that. Use compression strategies, use uh, future facing formats like um, WebP, WebM, um, AVIF um, and other formats as they're coming through um, that take advantage of kind of new developments in compression. Um, obviously check can I use so that you are able to actually <laughs> deliver a good experience for people and that they are actually able to 
people use your website, etc. Um, but there's loads and loads and loads of interesting and useful image strategies depending on your use case. You know, small small icons, the small images can be inline SVGs. They could also be um, data um, URLs and be imported as HTML, uh, essentially. You can um, use, you know, strategies to deal with the specific file format you're using. So like JPEGs, you can actually reduce the file format by having blurring. Uh, blurring a JPEG actually reduces the, the file size. So if you have only a small bit of the, the file that needs to be um, in focus, you could do a radial blur around it to give, you know, and this is, again, it's to do with the kinds of content and what kinds of things you're trying to achieve from it. If it's maybe a background image and it's a massive background image, you know, consider compressing it as hard as you can, maybe doing some blurring, and that will really bring that file down. So there's lots of kind of the file size strategies. And again, it all comes down to uh, making the best file, sorry, that's my phone, um, at the smallest size so that you can push the least amount of stuff over the wire from the server to the client. Uh, try and use native fonts where you can. Um, you know, don't reach for, you know, 10 different um, fonts, uh, web fonts, because, you know, each of those or most of those can be downloaded, especially if they're not cached on the client side. Uh, and there's other like, you know, interesting things like font subsetting and other things, tricky things that you can do to, again, reduce that file size. So content strategy, site architecture. So again, this is to do with kind of the presentation of your website, the thing that you're making, your web app, whatever. And it's to do with, you know, considering what you're actually presenting. Um, many years ago, there was this kind of the clamor to use tabs and modals and slides and accordions everywhere. And they would be hiding content um, now you have things like uh, lady, lazy load uh, on images and things like that, which kind of help you out. So you can put as many images as you like essentially on a page and it will only start loading it when it becomes into viewport. Um, some browsers uh, allow you to do that. Um, but you can imagine back in the day, we'd have a, a long slider and you'd have images as you know, a lot of images all loading into the page, making the page really bloated, and maybe someone would scroll down and never actually interact with the slider and see any of those images. So it's about using kind of uh, structure, presentation of the website itself in appropriate manner so that you don't have lots of wasted bloat on your site. You don't have all these things that people were never going to interact with, never really going to use, or it just kind of gets in the way. You know, be clear about what it is you want people to do, what people want to see, you know, all the sorts of stuff on your website. Um, and this comes down to like other things like plugins, like um, using third party libraries and, and, and presenting ads as well. You know, the least amount of ads that you can get away with, the least amount of third party um, libraries like uh, like buttons and share buttons and all this sort of thing. Some of these things are becoming more and more native. So you can actually use a native share button, for example, actually hooks into the operating system. More and more browsers are supporting these sorts of things. So there are other alternatives to some of this stuff, but everything that you bring in, again, is adding to the blow to the page, adding to the amount of stuff going over the wire. And we talked about some of this. Um, so we've already talked about some of those libraries, um, JS, everything, and caching in browsers. Again, browsers have this um, amazing ability to kind of help us out and go, this file hasn't changed. I'm going to present, I'm going to just cache that and bring that file up whenever a website requests it. So I've got it locally. I don't have to pass anything over the, over the wires. I don't have to create that kind of electricity usage to to make that happen. Um, so consider, um, you know, your URLs, making sure that, you know, if your URL changes, it's definitely needed, you know, so that maybe we can just cache it. That's fine. Um, maybe consider why you're using a JavaScript library. 
is it actually needed? Can you do it in vanilla JavaScript and send less JavaScript over the wire? Um, all these sorts of things. Um, don't you know? reduce the page weight, reduce the amount of electricity that you're using for your app, and maybe even use less, less electricity while the app is actually running on your user side as well. That might be useful, especially if it's mostly informational. So next we have web infrastructure and hosting. This again is a lot of stuff that we can kind of control. So we can kind of control where we host our information, where we host our websites. And we have a few things to consider. So again, we've got page weight there. So we have to consider kind of how much we're sending down the wire. We can also consider how far the actual information is coming to our user. If, for example, you have a company in the UK and most of their users actually happen to be in uh, America or in Australia, then you might want to consider hosting in those places, getting your, your website, your information closer to the user. It has less of a distance to travel and also deciding your host depending on the green credentials. And really, we have a lot to do in pushing those hosting companies, especially the big ones, into really clarifying what green credentials they have and not kind of just greenwashing, just saying we are green and you know, not really giving any details. So there's a lot more to do here in the aspect of actually finding out that information from our hosts and and if they don't have that information, pushing them right to them, uh, make sure that they're telling you where they stand on this stuff and maybe consider moving to a new host has electricity usage that is coming from a renewable uh, source. Uh, maybe they power their servers with their own electricity power, um, you know, usage with solar panels or um, whatever else it is. And they might have other strategies as well. So consider where you're hosting the, in distance, but also in uh, where they're getting their power from. And uh, the web infrastructure is also utilizing hardware, right? So we have server cost and we have utilization of the server. And we want to do some things to help ourselves out. So we want to, you know, we want, comp computation isn't free. So we want to make sure that we're doing work that the and the work we are doing on the server is work we want to do. And part of that is blocking bots, right? So we can, um, any request we get, which is unwarranted, maybe they're snooping around to see if you've got a wp.admin on your server or something like that, block them, just go, okay, well, that's, we're gonna refuse that request. Um, and there's lots of things that you can do here around blocking bots, so check that out. Um, whether it's on HT access and changing the information there, uh, if you're using Apache servers or, you know, a similar sort of situation for different uh, web server technologies. Uh, but really, you want to be giving your information, sending that information to people who are actually going to consume it and not loads and loads of bots or people trying to hammer you to um, give you spam or try and get into your logins or that sort of stuff. As much as you can, try and reject all that stuff. Um, and it's sort of an ongoing kind of issue that we as web designers, developers have to deal with. Um, but if you get up to date, that will really help you out. Again, we also have the hardware and we want to use the hardware to its fullest, right? So there's this idea that as I was reading in this, these books about greening the web, about how you can use too much of your server, CPU or capacity, and then you know it becomes less efficient, too little, and then you're kind of underutilizing your server and other apps or other people could be using it. So you want to be using you know your servers that you are um, paying for, you know, to a point where it's it's useful, you know, we don't want to be using it under its capacity. So these are usually reflected in the types of things you can buy. So like shared servers, um, dedicated servers, virtual servers, that's the sort of thing. So here you have a, 
a big app which you want to scale, you might have you know a virtual environment, you might have various services running in that environment or in different environments, and you want to scale quickly. Uh, if you have a small website with its own dedicated um, server, you just want to kind of like look and see, do I need this? Should it be on a shared server? Could I run several apps on this server? You know, how, what is my utilization? What is my bandwidth that I'm using here? Can I actually kind of reduce down the number of servers I'm running? Hopefully influencing the amount of servers that the service provider are using and hopefully reducing the amount of electricity we're using overall as an industry, right? Less servers, less infrastructure, the better, essentially. Again, you know, if you have a website that you don't need anymore, take it down, stop paying for it, stop using that electricity. And, you know, it's it sounds silly now saying it, but you know, these things are possible um, and they're not heresy. We don't have to hold on to everything. Um, lastly, in this section, uh, consider using things like CDNs um, and looking at green uh, internet infrastructure. So looking at, again, this is to do with where you're hosting things, their green credentials and how far away from your users are. Um, CDNs are good for, they're optimized for delivering things like images, um, static files, and they can exist um, in these large organizations closer to your users. Um, so this might be a good way of kind of optimizing for some of those things all at once. Um, and at the end, I've got a link to kind of, you know, where you might have uh, a view into a map of the world and what kinds of mixtures of, of electricity they use in different countries. So please check that out and also check out your hosting provider and what they say uh, their green credentials are. So the next one's an interesting one because it doesn't necessarily always feel um, incorporated into the conversation around environment and eco websites and technology. But we've got this whole side where we've created this thing and we then have a user interacting with it, right? And if you think about it, the whole power consumption is driven by the user. They are the ones who are searching for your app. They're clicking on it and they're clicking around it and they're doing stuff because they want to interact with your app or because they're made to, because um, maybe it's like, you know, for their parking and they have to pay within this website or app or something like that. So you at this point have the ability to make things better or worse at that, um, to do with you know your user behavior your user experience maybe dark patterns so you really want to consider um you know do i want to do i want to show them loads of ads do i want to string them out every time you do these sorts of things and present more and more pages again you're sending more information across the wire so you might want to compress down as much as you can their experience so that they can do it fast and efficiently hopefully are happier as users you're sending less stuff over the wire and that's all good and you're not doing dark patterns you're not making them do something that actually the user doesn't want to do you can imagine like cancelling some sort of su subscription a lot of services do this now where you go to cancel something it's maybe difficult to find it requires lots of clicking around and searching you try and um, unsubscribe and then you have this obscure cancel button. You have these other options and it becomes this really long and drawn out process. If you times that process by millions of people that are going to try and go through this process, you're creating this massive amount of unnecessary um, usage, unnecessary stuff of the wire and unnecessary carbon impact. So please consider what is best for the users, what is best for the planet in how you design and build the experience in itself. This also comes into like gambling and addiction. And there's this idea that, you know, some games are very on the edge here um, and some apps and you're building an experience that people love, but actually are you doing it because you want to keep people's attention? You want to keep people on the service, not because they necessarily actually want to be kept they want to interact you're kind of enforcing this kind of addiction this kind of 
idea around gambling, um, because you're pushing their buttons, because you're giving that tiny dopamine hit and you're engineering a way to give them that hit every time and they are interacting more and more and more and more. So this again comes under dark patterns and you want to consider this as, um, you know, not just an environmental issue, because again, you're sending more information over the wire, um, but you're also detracting maybe from that user's ability to kind of experience and flourish in their own life. You have this power as a creator to empower the user to create better habits, to create less energy usage, to push people to do things. Uh, and one of my, my favorite examples of this, it's, it's not even a very good example, but if you've ever been on Netflix and, and kind of left it on for a while, it just pops up a thing saying, you know, are you still watching this? And it stops the movie or stops the information. That saves them on bandwidth. That literally saves them on bandwidth because instead of it going all day on its own, it will stop. And those movies won't get sent over the wire until maybe you press OK. But it also gives the opportunity to the user to consider, to reflect and go, actually, you're probably right. I have been here for like three hours or whatever, and it is probably time to go outside or read a book or whatever it is. So you have this opportunity as you know, a designer or someone who's making something to then allow people to flourish and, and change experiences. Okay, so user interaction stuff, um, web performance stuff, infrastructure stuff. Um, some of you and some of us will have businesses, agencies, internal um, designers at companies. And we also have an interaction with our companies. So we have, we're kind of zooming out even further now. And it's worth considering how we store our data, you know, how we travel, how we travel to work. Is it necessary that we do traveling for our work? Um, the kinds of places we get our utilities from, you know, are we paying for, you know, green electricity? Are we paying green providers? Uh, really basic stuff like uh, where we're getting our food. Are we turning stuff off? Um, we have this um, terrible culture in our company that w people's comp um, computers don't always get turned off at the end of the day, right? Um, and it's unnecessary just to have them ticking over when they're not doing anything. You know, fair enough if you're doing some builds or you're doing some um, remote work that you need your computer on, that's fine. Just don't do it every day, right? Just don't leave it on every day. It's unnecessary. It's just uh, it's just waste at that point. Um, so re reducing as much as possible and getting things from, you know, appropriate places. And again, this helps with kind of the bottom line. You know, you might pay slightly more for electricity, but you're saving overall because you're not using as much le electricity, um, etc. Um, also, you know, this is really important that you interact with other companies. You know, it's a bit like saying no to tobacco, you know, or no to big oil. You might have principles as a business. I don't, we don't do um, design work for tobacco companies or arms companies or something like that. And that's really awesome. But we have this opportunity to, you know, also extend that out and go, you know, we have procurement um contracts that we want to keep and you have to uh, you know adhere to certain things you have to as a, as a service provider um, make sure that you're just showing us that you get your internet from certain um, places um, and that you have certain practices and these th sorts of things that we can do today right and, and we can enforce these things and it means that we're encouraging the industry to come up together you know we're influencing everyone and they'd be like well I can't deal with you because um, you know you're mostly buying from Eon or whatever and Eon haven't got great green credentials I'm just kind of spitballing here so you know come back to us in a, in six months once you know that's changed whatever it is that's fine and we can talk and some of that stuff we can build into our procurement process like we do with some of the other stuff that I've been talking about. 
Um, and lastly, in this section, we have this kind of, we have cultures that we nurture in companies. We want to nurture, you know, diversity and we want to nurture um, uh, autonomy and things like this. You know, we want to empower our employees to be better, more mobile employees to, to do things. But we also want to kind of create, you know, possibly create a culture of ethical thinking, improvement and being able to say, you know, if you spot something which we could do better, you know, you could tell us. And we could maybe do better. We could change that. Or maybe we could change that in five months' time, six months' time, or maybe next year. But we have that on our radar, and you can try and utilise your employees and your whole network to slowly, you know, uh, improve the the environment, improve the culture, and improve your business and how it works. So... Lastly, kind of, kind of segueing onto what people can do, um, we have this idea of like social norms and hardware trends. So we haven't really talked too much. We talked a bit about the user, um, and the user has a, um, what we normally say in web world is a client. We have like a device which has a browser on it or something like that, and we have this kind of perpetual kind of technology hype cycle, hardware hype cycle. And I think that is, I mean, it doesn't feel like it, but I sort of feel like that whole ship has sailed sort of thing, where we have so much technology now, and technology can be in your toaster, in your toothbrush. I mean, and by technology, I mean sophisticated chipsets, which, you know, phone the internet and stuff like this. And it seems somewhat unnecessary, but it's also very cheap and available. And what we should you know, consider is that we can create software hype cycles and we can create software um, without this kind of massive um, environmental burden, which is kind of baked in, um, especially if we move to more renewable sources of electricity. So we need to possibly encourage a move away from, you know, phone hype cycles, computer hype cycles. It's not to say that we should stop innovating it's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the the trends and the fashion of changing things because of fashion, because of trends, um, should be discouraged. We should change things because of efficiency, because of utility, um, because of all these useful things, rather than because it's the new shiny, it's, um, you know, fits slightly better in my pocket or because, you know, the next person in my class has got one, therefore I need to have one. All that sort of thing is this kind of horrible um, hype cycle, which we just don't need anymore, really. We need to move past that, essentially. And I guess this is a whole conversation that we can have, and, and I'm really open to it. I'd love to have, you know, this is my side of it. Um, and I'd love to talk to manufacturers and, and people like that. But we should consider where this is coming from and do we need to buy a new phone? Do we need to buy a new computer? Do we need six computers? Do we need, do, what do we actually need to, to exist and to work and, and, and prosper? Um, so finally, uh, we're getting near the end now. Um, I feel like I've only scratched, scratched the surface really, but I guess this comes into lots of other ideas that we find in the web and technology. Um, so what else can we do? Um, so if you're asking yourself, you know, okay, Ben, you know, I'm on board with some of this stuff. I'm going to look into some of the other stuff. We could also do some basic things like advocate for um, certain, you know, uses of technology and environmental stuff. We could vote with our wallet. We can literally buy things which are greener, you know, upgradable, fixable, Modular, these are good words. Uh, greener, not embedded with, um, you know, slave trade. You know, all these things that we socially don't really want to see in our world anymore. Um, we can send a message with search. We can, we can tell Google. We can tell our search engine. Uh, we can change it to Ecoseya. And we can, you know, we can do small things which actually point us in a direction, make a message especially a message to the big technology powers which have 
wait to do things um, en masse. And we could also go to climate-emergency.com and we can declare a climate emergency. We can put badges on our websites to say that we care about these things. We've maybe got um, some information about the kinds of things that we care about, maybe about the things we've done, maybe about the things we're striving to continue to do. This sort of information is again advocating and disseminating this this like good work the idea that we can work together and we are going to have to make a discussion about this and we're going to have to you know have those awkward conversations but we can do that together um so what i don't know what is kind of excluded from from this is i don't I couldn't find any information about uh, ISPs, internet service providers, that is very opaque about the literal infrastructure and how green um, and how that is powered, what kinds of hardware, what kinds of electricity uh, purchasing is embedded in the actual ISP level. So your Virgin Medias, your big telnets, um, all those sorts of people are actually you know, you're typing in the URL and it's going to send a message and it's going via their cables. So it would be lush to get more information from them or someone who knows about the kinds of things that they are trying to do. Um, I don't necessarily know, I couldn't find good information about the greenest way to reuse or dispose of your tech. Say you're upgrading to the latest MacBook or something like that. Is it best to give your MacBook back to Apple? Is it actually better than selling it on? Selling it on, is that better? Is the new MacBook going to be greener? So these kind of questions are sort of not very easy to um, find and um, cross-compare in one place. Also, offsetting comes up in this um, world a lot. And it seems to me that offsetting is often um, kind of a band-aid. And it's probably the last thing you want to do after you've reduced, you've changed internet um, electricity providers, you've done as much as you can, maybe you want to do more and offsetting is that more, but you can't necessarily just say I'm offsetting all my internet and my usage um, against planting trees in Africa or something like that. That, <laughs> that isn't creating the environment that we can continue to live in. That's just, um, again, like putting a band-aid on something. What we want to do is we want to stem the flow in the first place. We want to reduce and we want to essentially not need the offsetting. Um, you need, to, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to get at a good idea of how, how well the offsetting is actually being uh, working and achieving its, its game, its aims. So what I would say is, again, like do all these things first, offsetting um, is just not, it's just not the answer, basically. Anyway, so some of the sponsors from the Bath Digital Festival. Thank you. I've been Ben Byford. Um, you can find the um, slides here. Um, you can also find me at benbyford.com. Um, you can find all these links that I was mentioning that I was looking through. Um, and for extra credits, um, also consider email every other com um, communication that goes over those wires. Again, you know, it takes carbon to send an email, it takes carbon to receive an email. Consider unsubscribing for all those emails you don't need anymore. Um, and, you know, consider how much you actually need to stay connected. Because every time you open your phone, you have your phone on, you know, roaming, receiving messages all the time. You are pinging the network, you're creating um, more information to be sent through to connect to the servers to bring those information back to bring it back to your phone to bring it back to your computer so consider maybe also for your mental health reducing the amount of polling you're doing with your devices reduce the amount of email that you consume and by consume I mean receive probably a load of spam a load of promotional stuff unsubscribe delete put into spam folders all that sort of stuff also will help in this whole environmental situation as well. And again, it will send a message. Um, so that's great. 
Thank you so much for your time. Um, please um, message me, comment. Um, it'd be great to continue this and have a full proper conversation. And I'm sorry it's been so long. Thanks. Goodbye.